I'm in private practice right now and I have offices in Miami, Orlando, and I work in private schools and, and public schools, but I worked 10 years in the public schools. I was an RTI trainer and I really do believe in the marriage between, you know, doing classroom level work and uh, standardized assessment. So I cannot possibly do an assessment, even in private practice, unless I have worked thoroughly in trying to see what happened at the classroom level. The bulk of you, I'm assuming, have, um, are working in the schools. So typically, the majority of the school psychologists work in the schools. Uh, work in the school. So you have the luxury of having access to all this information that I'm going to tell you that you should be looking into. Um, so, you know, it's easier because for me in private practice, I have to ask the parents, you know, get me this, get me the reports, get me the, uh, you know, your uh, test, get me the classroom production, anything that I can get in order to assess this. And sometimes I schedule a meeting with a teacher so I can, you know, on the phone, we can talk and I can ask questions and I have to ask the parents a lot of questions as well. So um, what's interesting is, um, you know, that we have to really, if we are going to work with bilinguals, we have to understand that bilingual work always must start with very thorough classroom level work, okay? So some learning objectives today, uh, we, uh, again, I talked about reading, being the focus of this presentation. And we're gonna use consultation on, uh, with parents. So I'm assuming that, you know, I'm gonna teach you, like what are you gonna ask parents or what are you gonna ask teachers? Um, and then look at the classroom formative assessment that was done uh, or help us and facilitate uh, the teacher doing formative assessment because we wanna differentiate whether it's learning uh, to read or it's, if it's a speech and language problem or if it's English acquisition, you know, so those kind of blur and they share commonalities, but at the same time, we as experts have to discern what is it, right? Is it one or the other? Um, and then we want to apply, you know, you, the, our NAS model wants us to develop appropriate instructional interventions and then improve outcomes. So the idea being that we are culturally competent. Before we move forward, I wanted to bring to your attention that back in 2015, I, with a, um, a number of colleagues, we developed this position statement from NASP, it's a, the provision of school psychological services to bilingual students. And if you haven't read it, please, you know, Google it, go to NASP, the NASP website or Google it, it will come up and uh, download it and do read it because we, um, you know, it's a, it's a short, succinct document, but we give you a platform as to what is it that we need to engage in in order to provide non-discriminatory work in um, working with bilingual students. So we know that ELLs, uh, you know, by state, of course, the typical is that, you know, California, Texas, New York, and those typical states were the ones that had the, the majority of ELLs, right? Like we always know those states were the ones that had the majority of ELLs. But what's interesting is that, um, that there's a change in population increase. So if we look at the typical states like Texas and California and New York, uh, they are not that have the most growth because here on the right, you see that for instance, uh, a state that used to not have so much growth or does not have as many ELLs, Nebraska at the very bottom, the growth of immigrant population is large. So what does that mean? If you look at this chart, that means that across the states, the population, the movement of population is different. We no longer see the patterns that the typical states have the ELLs. Now we see a huge increase in states that did not have ELLs. The other thing is too, to keep in mind that a lot of the, what we're going to be talking about today, okay, applies to language learners, period. So not second language learners. I was, I just lost service. But, did somebody say something? Oh. It says it's unstable. Um, Paola, can you mute yourself? Some, I think I, he, I can hear you. All right, thank you, Paola. Okay, so, um, so, so think about um, that, you know, the population is moving. So where 
in your state, maybe you didn't have a large population, but at the same time, the kids that are low CS, for instance, and do not have access to language as much as some kid that has the ability of abundance, and maybe they're taking trips to Europe to learn about culture, where somebody else is learning it from a book and doesn't have the access to enrichment and, and that external access that makes somebody very language rich. So a lot of the principles are going to apply to, to language learners, period. Okay, so not just second language learners. So keep that in mind. Um, so that English learners are a diverse group. And what we know is that um, they, are, they can be newcomer immigrants. They, with limited English proficiency, we can be immigrant bilingual learners, second generation American English learners, North American Indian, Indians, long-term ELLs, ELLs with disabilities. So what does this mean? That this means that there's not one set of bilingual learners. So you have to be very good at differentiating, you know, what is it that makes some group, you know, different than others. Uh, the reality is that, for instance, a lot of our tests are developed and then you see, okay, it includes the Hispanic population or it includes bilinguals or it includes this and that. But bilingual could mean a lot of things. You know, I'm bilingual, very proficient in both English and Spanish, but I, you know, was raised in Spanish mostly. So I'm bilingual, uh, my native language is uh, Spanish. If you think about my mom, my mom is bilingual, but my mom can barely hold a conversation, maybe just like, can I go to the bathroom? Or, you know, just like the basic conversation. And then there's some people in the middle. So it varies a lot. So we have to keep that in mind for kids as well. So there's a difference between language acquisition and language learning. So acquisition on the one side and then learning on the other side. Acquisition just happens automatically. It's just implicit, subconscious. You have to think about it. You know, it just happens informally, you know, day to day. And um, you, it depends on the attitude because some people are more out there, more outgoing, and then are, they're going to interact more and there is a stable order, but the learning has to be explicit. So when you learn a second language, you have to teach it. You have to think about it when you're trying to learn. It has to be conscious. It's more formal. So in the classroom, classroom is formal. You, we have to be intentional about the, teaching that language. We have to teach the grammatical rules because it's not just like a field that you kind of learn and you don't know who taught you and you just learn, right? And then aptitude matters. So for second language, aptitude does matter. And, uh, and there's a simple to complex order. It, it will depend on a lot of factors that we're gonna talk about. So there's this concept of VIX and COP, which I'm sure a lot of you know about, but I'm gonna you know, just bring it up um, rather quickly just for the people that have not been exposed to this. But Clemens in 1981, long time ago, and we're still using this because the brain hasn't changed since 1981. Um, so VIX and COP is the concept that uh, you develop the pace, basic interpersonal communication skills, which is VIX, within the first two years or so of being exposed to language. So what does that mean? Conversational fluency, your vocabulary, the grammatical rules of pronunciation. So you, you have a child that comes and say they come in the lower grades and they come in second grade. So second, third, and then by fourth, they have bits and they can talk. And you know what? Kids, when they're younger, they can have the pronunciation so, um, they can attain it so well that they sound fluent. They sound like they're native when, they're, when the brain um, allows, when they're young enough. Not for older people, because that ability to obtain uh, their pronunciation in the brain, it kind of goes uh, later on. So. Um, but they sound so fluent that after two years, the teachers will tell you or the parents will say, oh, he learned English so fast. Within a year, he learned English and he's fine. English is not a problem. This is not a problem with English. And I have heard it over and over and over, and I'm sure you have as well. Tov, on the other hand, develops in a long time. It could take, you know, five to seven, year, seven years. It, it just develops, you know, in a long time. Um, some people say it can take nine years. So what, how does it change and, and how do you ensure that the cognitive academic language proficiency is attained? 
that is more of the abstract language that we need. It's more, it has that complexity, you know, you have to analyze, synthesize, you have to evaluate, and the complex language that say you and I would need if, um, let's see, I was trying to take French after being in France a couple of years ago and I could not, I was frustrated. So I came back and I was taking French for five months, but then I gave it up, I was too busy. But then if I moved to France, there's no way I would be able to attend graduate school in French, okay? So help is needed for that level of complexity. For my level, I'm not gonna go to elementary, middle, or high school, I would go to class in college or you know graduate school, I would not be able to attend because I don't have help in French. So that's the level of, of language that you need in the classroom as well. So it's the, the according to the developmental level and a child of course can't compare their fifth grade to a, you know to you or I in a graduate level coursework of course. But then that first and second language do share common underlying proficiency and how much they share will depend on the orthography. It, it will depend on whether say there are romance like English and Spanish they come from the same group. So they're called romance. So it, it will depend on a lot of things. So we will talk a little bit about that, okay? So when we think about BICs being easy and Cal being difficult, we also have other aspects of um, cognitive demand when it comes to anything that we are exposed to regarding language. Context embedded meaning very, um, you know, a lot of cues. There's context and you give cues to the child so when it's easy, when you tell them explicit directions in the upper left quadrant, you know, you give them explicit directions, you have face-to-face -face conversation, you have maps, you give them the vocabulary, or the, maybe they're even watching a movie that they see the, the, um, they see the action, what's happening with the word, so they can see it, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, you have uh, very few cues but easy vocabulary, maybe a phone conversation or a presentation of material, sometimes reading for personal purposes or easy material uh, and so forth. But then when it's highly demanding, when you have some cues like demonstrations, lessons, math computations, geometry, there's a cognitive demand there, but you're still, if you taught them, you know, you have some cues but then when it's few cues or context reduced, look here at the very top, standardized tests. Isn't that what we give? We give standardized tests to test our children, right? So that's very uh, few cues, word problems, textbooks, lectures with few visuals, reading, writing, and content area. So it just becomes more difficult. So the first thing you wanna um, do is um, to look at how your district measures oral language proficiency. Um, the last in-person presentation I did this year was in Minnesota. So I had this up, so I just kind of reused it. So Minnesota has, um, I don't know if any of you are from Minnesota, but they, they have an English language development program entrance and continuing English learner eligibility. You know, every state has their own, sometimes it varies by the district. So you must get yourself familiar with how your district measures oral language proficiency. It's a must. You must get familiar with that, okay? And for instance, uh, for those districts that use the WIDA model, um, like I'm in Florida, was, um, you know, many use the WIDA model, and they have like different levels, you know, like uh, starting up, beginning, developing, expanding, bridging over. So if you look at what your district is doing and how they're measuring, and you look at where they are and you understand, like for instance, they're in level three. Okay, what does level three mean? Well, then you, you see that level three means that the receptive language, they can use expanded sentences in oral interaction or their productive language, but if they're in level five, they have bridged over. However, be careful because the levels in these tests are not, um, you know, at the level of help necessarily. You have to be careful. But if this is all you have, use the data that you have. It's very important that you use the data that you have. Some language acquisition principles. We know that acquisition of that um, language or that second language is gradual, but at the same time can be complex because it follows a process and it will depend on the learner's social, cultural, personal characteristics, okay? 
So there's that process going from big through pop. So again, we started with basic language and into that cognitive academic language. So it, it, it just follows that process and it could take five, seven years, depending on how rich the instruction is in the classroom. So if we're not doing a good job, it's not gonna be five years, okay, you're done. No, if we're not doing a good job providing the oral language proficiency instruction that we'll talk about, then forget it. How could they, they can become long-term English learners, which is a term that we use for those that have been in education since elementary, they're in high school and they still have not developed how. Then language acquisition and the learning process can occur at the same time. So we can do it simultaneously. We don't have to do one after the other. They don't have to be sequential, but they have to reach specific levels of proficiency. Um, some other principles is that they have to be exposed to opportunities to, for them to learn and they have to facilitate, it has to be facilitated. It can't just be, you know, um, it has to be implicit, uh, not implicit, but explicit. And we have to remember that skills transfer from native to second language. So we'll, we'll talk about that and how much it can transfer and it will depend on whether they share orthography and structures and grammar and all of that, okay? So before we move, we know, and one of the questions that you know, came to me was, okay, how do I know if it's a learning disability and not a, uh, you know, a language issue? And of course, uh, we have to uh, understand that um, you know, the, Florida, the IDA register, the statutes under you know, the Individual Disabilities Education Act at the federal level, uh, we have a definition, but part of the definition is saying that the child has a specific learning disability, but as long as it's not primarily, or the, or the lack of learning or the difficulty learning is not primarily the result of a visual hearing or motor disability, intellectual disability, emotional disturbance, cultural factors, environmental or economic disadvantage, or limited English proficiency. Environmental and economic disadvantage, we always see that, we may see that in our um, immigrant population as well. So, and you know, the cultural factors, so the last three are kind of intertwined in many ways, but we're definitely talking about, you know, cultural and limited English proficiency more here. So before we go into the reading aspects, I want to uh, uh, let you know that we have to, as we are looking into the classrooms and we're looking at whether these kids are, are being provided those ESOL accommodations or the ELL accommodations, uh, that you, you have to, when you consult or when you observe, you have to ensure that this is happening because if we're not providing accommodations, so forget about instruction, we have to accommodate the curriculum, then the, um, the children are not going to be having that access to instruction, okay? So then we divide into engage representation response. So I have listed, um, you know, a few things here. Uh, and their engagement, like is, do they have authentic and culturally responsive lessons? Are they provided choices that consider preferences? Are the rules posted and so forth? So under presentation, do they have visual materials? Do they have links that are embedded? Do they have comprehensible, manage manageable chunking of content? And under response, are they given extended time to complete tasks and is that time significant? So extended time doesn't mean that we just let them do whatever, right? We have to engage them. So a response has to, of course, mean that we also have to engage and present good materials, alternate formats and so forth. And we're providing formative teaching and assessment strategies, allowing editing after corrective feedback grading the final product should not be based on the first assessment. So these are some of the accommodations. By the way, if you're wondering if, if you're trying to take notes, I'm going to make the handout available and we will post it in the Facebook group, okay? So don't worry about it. Exactly what you see will be in the handout. So I'm gonna give you a lot of um, uh, this for you to have, so don't worry about it. Um, then to identify and address the specific, specific needs, the National Center for Cultural Responsive Educational Systems, so NCRES, recommends 
that we have to discuss or we have to take a look at the background variables of the uh, English learners because we have to look at the factors that are impacting their learning. We have to look at the instructional practices, of course, like I said, it doesn't mean that in five years automatically they will develop COP. No, we have to go use good research-based based instructional practices. We have to collect data that can help them and, uh, you know, and then we have to adjust, use that data to adjust progress monitoring and graphing data. I can tell you that that's, you, that's a must because we have to really make decisions based on data. But the most important thing to me is this is where you become really culturally competent is that you have to learn to use non-discriminatory interpretation of the data because we can collect data all we want. We can give all of the tests on the market okay standardized or we can use curriculum based assessment but if we don't know how to interpret the data that's going to be a big problem okay so i'm going to go through the different elements of reading um, because of time i'm not going to be able to go through every slide that i included here but what i'm what i did i didn't want to cut information off so under each area of reading I'm going to talk about it, but then I also have instructional strategies that are research based for ELLs that are going to be in the PowerPoint. So I, I will I will show you in the PowerPoint. So I'm, I'm going to skip a few, but I'll, I'll point out to what I'm skipping. So, you know, okay. So uh, these are the six areas or elements of reading for successful reading for ELL for any reader, actually. But what's interesting, and um, the, these latter five were by the National Reading Panel, for those of you that remember over a decade ago, the five areas of reading, but then later on, two years later, the National Literacy Panel said, no, wait a second, you forgot oral language. So oral language is basic. Uh, you must have that and you must master that in order to be a successful reading because there are different strands that are woven into skilled reading. It involves language comprehension, and it involves word recognition. So a lot of dyslexic kids have these problems with word recognition, the phonological awareness, the coding, cyber recognition. But then we also have the language comprehension. Do they have the vocabulary, the structure, the grammatical structure, so according to the orthographies, the reasoning that are they able to make? And do they have that literacy knowledge depending on the quality of instruction? Because all of that is woven together to become fluent executors of the word recognition and text comprehension. So it's important that we know that. So what are the typical oral language challenges? For instance, in the font for ELLs, phonological is the rules for combining sounds into words. And we're, we're gonna talk about phonics later on. And uh, it, this will depend on the orthography that they come from, of course. Uh, semantic uh, rules for combining words to convey meaning syntactic, the grammar rules that we use in conversation, and pragmatic, the rules for appropriate language use, right? So these are rules of language that, you know, um, I wish I had time to go over a little bit, but, but let me tell you, for an ELL, um, and this is really interesting, eye-opening, when it turns to rain, we say it is clouding up. When the sun comes out, we say it is clearing up. When it rains, it wets up the earth, when it doesn't rain for a while, things dry up. One could go on and on, but I rub up. You see, for now, my time is up, so I'll shut up. So imagine how many times and how many ways are we using up? Many different ways, right? So it's interesting because, um, you know, we have definitely a lot of uh, confusion for ELS. So what are some of the academic challenges for language? Uh, we have big on COP, we talked about, but at the same time, we also have the school navigational language and the curriculum content language. So the school navigational language is basically that um, language that you use or, or they have to learn in order to be successful in every day across the, class, the classrooms. So it is that language that transfers from classroom to classroom because the curriculum content language is more the language that is specific to say science or biology or the specific content content that they need to learn so um, those are some of the challenges that they're going to encounter so the content language uh, they're more successful because what we have to, if we teach them background knowledge we provide comprehensible input we have to develop 
um, the literacy skills and scaffold their instruction. We want to offer practice and application of what they're learning. And we want to embed frequent formative assessments in order for them to develop that content language. So for those of you that work in middle school and, and high school, okay, you're not teaching phonics, phonemic awareness, and all those skills that are usually taught in first, second, third grade, right, or even up to second grade. Um, of course, you're not, you, you know, it's hard for them to go back, but they can teach through content and they, and they are going to have to teach through content. So you have to uh, understand that. But also all of the vocabulary is also taught through content. So uh, it's important to know. So here are some research-based instructional strategies that I told you that typically I talk about these, but I won't have time for this presentation, but I didn't want to not give it to you. So basically, when you're doing consultations within the classroom, you can kind of recommend some things that the teachers can use. Or if you're giving an assessment yourself and then you, you find areas of skill deficits and oral language is one area of skill deficit, then you can give these strategies um, for, um, for them to follow. Okay, so here's another one. Productive talk is a great one. And again, I won't go over these. And then the do's and don'ts of productive talk. So you'll get this, but I'm not going to go over it because of time. Okay. Um, immersion. So some of you have different programs. So these are immersion instruction strategies for a language proficiency, sheltered instruction strategies. And so, so you have those. Okay. So then uh, phonemic awareness is another area that we're going to uh, briefly go over because uh, you know the phonemic awareness and most of you know the ability to hear, identify, think about, and manipulate sounds or the phonemes in spoken words. And then we recognize the uh, words within the sentence, the sounds within words, and the sounds within the syllables. It improves the ability to manipulate the sounds accurately, the code and spell words. So here's some research base. And again, you know, we isolate, we recognize, we manipulate, and, and you probably have worked with phonemes before. So, um, and then phonics. Phonics is super important because what happens is the different orthographies, okay, the different ortho orthographies that different languages have um, are in a continuum. So the, the systems vary according to the degree to which they respect the alphabetic system. So we have more opaque, or more transparent languages. More transparent is when the grapheme to phoneme correspondence is one-to-one. -one. So one-to-one -one grapheme to phoneme, so the sound of the individual, so you see a letter and it has only one sound, right? More opaque is that when one phoneme corresponds to several graphemes and one grapheme corresponds to several phonemes. So there's no one-to-one -one correspondence. Interestingly enough, reading difficulties are more common in countries where the orthography is more complex, in essence, more opaque. For instance, English, French, Danish, Portuguese, right? More opaque because in English, we, we don't have one sound for each letter. We have A, A, E, I, O, U, U, but A doesn't have just one sound, right? But in, in Spanish, more transparent, yes, a E I O U is A E E O U. That's it. So there's only one sound. So it's more transparent. So there's more reading difficulties when there is a difference in the orthography. So we have to know that. So what are some challenges? And this is, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here because what happens is when we are looking at is it language acquisition? Is it a learning disability? Is it a speech and language problem? we have to look at orthography. We must look at the, at the orthography of L1 in order to understand if the errors that they're making are due to how the brain processes information. So I don't have the slides about the brain here, but just briefly, let me explain to you that the brain, you know, we have executive functions, okay? So the executive functions have different areas that we use like inhibition, working memory, and so forth to process language. So when you have L1 as dominant language and you're reading or you're trying to uh, either read or write or speak the second language, 
what happens is your brain automatically will pull from the existing body, of, the existing knowledge that you have, and will try to in, include that knowledge into what you're trying to read. So uh, if you are used to just orthographically pronounce in Spanish, V and V, both spelled B. So there's no uh, V, like the, the, the V uh, letter V sound that we have. They're both B in uh, Spanish. So it could be that when they speak or when they're reading or when they're trying to combine words that use that sound, their brain is not able to inhibit that other sound and it's actually replacing that sound with what they know. But if you think about each individual sound then becomes a phoneme and then becomes a word and that word becomes a sentence and the sentence becomes text. Imagine how complex that process is for a second language learner. So these are some of the Spanish speaker challenges when learning to read English. Vowels of one sound, D between words sounds like TH. The G is always G as in get and not as in jam. There's no TH sound, okay? So the more proficient you are in the second language, the better you're able to inhibit your brain's automatic, you know, production of your L1 in order to produce L2. So if you have a written piece, if you, if you say, oh, the child, he can't spell, so he must have a writing disability. Well, have you thought about how long they have been in the country and maybe the errors are due to orthography. The errors may, may not be due to a learning disability. It may be that they're still in the process of learning and they have learned in their native language, depending on when they came here, and they have the sounds and they learned how to write according to the sounds that they knew and how to assign those sounds to what they're writing. I hope that makes sense, okay? Um, so these are in Spanish, some of the uh, errors. In Hmong, for instance, you know, um, English sounds not present in, in Hmong. Consonants, like the j as in jet, um, diagraphs, vowels, R control vowels, variant vowels, plurals, not used, so grammar mistakes, right? So pronouns, so I don't speak Hmong. So basically what I do is a lot of this information is online. A lot of this information, I literally, we go and we research and we find it. So if you have a language that you don't know the orthographic system, Google it, you will find it. And try to see if the errors are due to orthography because chances are a lot of the errors are due to orthography and they're having trouble uh, facilitating that in the second language. Another issue with, uh, like this is Arabic, they use a non-Roman alphabet, you know, just like, you know, Hmong and some Asian languages. They're right from right to left. So imagine the fluency. There's no distinction between upper and lowercase letters. So if they're making those errors, is that a writing disability? You know, uh, English sounds are not present, like the P and the, the P and the V are not, are consonant sounds. So they pronounce pill as bill. So those are errors that when they pronounce, but also when they write and when they're reading, they may not be able to do. And then the fluency is going to be affected. And then their fluency of text is going to be affected and their comprehension is going to be affected because imagine the cognitive demand that they have in order to inhibit L1 and then have to produce L2 and then do again at the sound level, at the phoneme, at the word, at the sentence and the text level. It's a lot, okay? So just keep this in mind. So this is very important. Uh, again, this is for you to look at uh, later on, research-based bonus instructional strategies. Fluency. Fluency is interesting because we tend to think of fluency as, oh, they, it, even if they don't understand, they can just like read fluency and they should be able to read fluency if they know how to read the words. Well, not, not so, because automaticity and word recognition skill is needed, but also they have to have access to knowledge of word meanings. They have to understand the vocabulary. It can't just be that they know the word. They have to understand understand the vocabulary because what's going to happen is again the brain is going to fill in the blank with what they know 
And that's when they, you see uh, errors that they make when they start to read and they fill with something else, right? And you see that actually not even in, you know, um, second language learners alone because you see those errors. But keep in mind that in their head, they may have a word that they know in their native language and they're filling that word because the um, executive function in the brain is not inhibiting that L1 and they're not proficient in the L2 yet and there's difficulty with that um, uh, inhibition, okay? And then they have to keep a lot of information on working memory. They have to have the retrieval automaticity and so forth. So fluency embodies rate and the student, the student's ability to reconnect the text with the proper phrasing, prosody, inflection. So imagine the cognitive demand when they're having to facilitate that production of uh, L2 and then inhibit L1. So um, that's important to know. So here's some um, instructional strategies that are research-based for ELLs that, that you can take a look at later, okay? So I have that. Um, Fluency instructional strategies, progress monitoring strategies as well. Fluency is very, uh, like a lot of progress monitoring for fluency as well. Vocabulary, then we have tiers of vocabulary. So tier one, that big social basic navigational words that we talk about, can I use the bathroom? Let's go here, let's go there, right? Tier two, that navigational high frequency, high utility. Remember I, we talked about that academic, language, so the one that travels across different subjects that you can use. And then the level, the tier three would be the low frequency context specific academic words. You want the LLs to learn a lot of tier two. That's, these are the words that you want to teach. So you want to tell teachers to concentrate on these words because these are the ones that are going to be uh, making them more successful because those words are going to be applicable to all of the different subjects. And uh, these are some strategies to teach content vocabulary that you can use um, systematic academic vocabulary instruction, cognate instruction. Cognate are words with similar spelling and meaning in the native language and English. So profound, profundo, contagious, contagioso. And uh, so sometimes we, we can use cognate. So if you want to learn more about cognate instruction, Google it, teaching through cognate is good. But again, there has to be a, a, a similarity between the languages. So it doesn't work if you have different orthographies with like, uh, you know, mong or different uh, words that are, are not the same orthography, okay? And then we have comprehension. And then we have, of course, a lot of challenges with comprehension, like the accuracy and speed we talked about because Speed is also mediated by whether they know the words or not, uh, vocabulary knowledge, do they understand the text structure, the grammatical structure, are they, uh, is their grammatical structure different? Uh, Spanish and English, you know, um, la casa roja versus la, la roja casa, like, you know, when you do the literal translation, it, it, the grammar is different, right? The ability to use or formulate ideas, inferences from text, monitor, summarize what was read, and a lot of problems depending on what language they have. And here are some comprehension strategies. So the strategies that I'm giving you is also for you when you do consultation or when you go to the classroom, you have to know are the teachers using research-based strategies for the uh, classroom or are they not? And if they're not, maybe the problems are that they're not you know, doing adequate instruction. This is how you activate background knowledge. It's really important. Background knowledge is super important because like say you're trying to teach a third grader uh, to read uh, or you're trying to teach comprehension, but you are using a story that has to do with fire engines and uh, fire hydrants and so forth, but they came from a very small town in Guatemala where they did not have any fire engines or fire hydrants. So all those concepts are hard for this child. Or if you're trying to teach a Mexican kid about you know, comprehension, but you use a party with pinatas or something more cultural, maybe then you know, it's easier to activate that background knowledge. So you want to use rigorous text. And this is super important because what we tend to do is we tend to wash down the curriculum because they're ELLs. So we don't want to teach grade level, and that's the opposite. You want to use rigorous text, grade level, but what you have to do is you have to make it comprehensible. 
and divide it up and use chunks of information because you have to teach grade level because otherwise they're never going to catch up. Okay, so don't wash it down. You want to use rigorous text. Um, and this is what we talked about. Use shorter, challenging text. So you don't want to do it all at once. You want to separate it. You want to have uh, them plan for independent reading and you can take a look at how this is done later on. So some of the interventions. Okay, so then, you know, we kind of like look at the classroom and say, um, you know, somebody comes and says, I want you to evaluate an ELL or, you know, what is it that I do? I'm in private practice or, you know, how am I going to start the process evaluating somebody? So I, I asked a few questions, you know, I, write, I wrote them down. So what are the characteristics of English uh, learners? Is the child a newcomer, long-term English learner? You know, I, I gave you a list at the beginning, all kinds of different bilinguals, right? What languages have they been exposed to? Because we want to know the orthography, you know? Have they been exposed to English? Because some countries, they teach some English. Is the uh, child proficient in the native language or in English or in both? That helps. Are their language delays or social communication challenges when compared to their native peers? So this is where it's helpful to know from the teacher, not just the parent, because the parents don't necessarily know all this information. I, I guess you, you, know, you probably know that, right? So um, has uh, the child be, uh, been exposed to English formally or, inform or informally? And formally would mean that they actually got instruction in English. Is she orally proficient in one or both, both languages? And what language has she been instructed and for how long? Was she showing appropriate academic progress, progress in their native language? You don't always have this information, but th this is information that you want to know, you know, and try to ask the parent if, you know, if they are able to tell you. Is her current progress consistent with the progress of other English learners with similar language proficiency and instructional support? I'm going to give you an example of that because we now have an instrument that measures that, which is fantastic. Uh, the Ortiz PVAT, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, can the observed difficulties be related to poorly matched instruction or an effective strategy? So maybe when you're looking at the teacher practice and now that I kind of walk you through all the areas, maybe there was poorly matched instruction or an effective strategy. So maybe that's the reason why they're not learning. Okay, so you have to know. When provided with appropriate instruction, support and accommodations, does she continue to struggle? So what if the teacher's really following to the T or very close and you know, the, the kid continues to struggle? That's important to know. Are you fully trained, and this is important, to conduct a responsive and fair assessment that deals relevant information to guide interventions and identify accommodations? I put this here because I need us to be self-aware. We have to have self-awareness of our capability and our ability to do culturally competent assessments because what happens is we tend to um, do assessments and um, you know, think that we can apply everything that we do for the monolinguals and whatnot. And it doesn't mean that we're not good school psychologists. It just means that we don't have the training to do the culturally competent assessment. So it may mean that you need to consult with somebody. It may mean that you need to um, reach out to your bilingual team reach out to another, you know, speech and language person maybe. So it may mean a lot of things. So keep that in mind, okay? So be very self-aware. Also, don't think that because you speak Spanish or you speak the other language, you are culturally competent. Speaking the language alone doesn't mean that you're culturally competent. You have to know certain things as, as we uh, talked about. So I would much rather have my child tested by somebody that is monolingual school psychologist culturally competent than a bilingual school psychologist in my child's language that is not culturally competent. That's how strongly I feel about this, okay? So keep that in mind. And also keep in mind that we no longer can count on the bilingual team or a bilingual school psychologist because there's not enough bilinguals to test all the kids. And also there's not enough bilingual school psychologists that speak every single language of every single possibility that we will have and there are not enough tests developed for every single language, so forget it. Now we must learn to test everybody, okay? So, so these are the things that I also take a look at. 
the level of acculturation and assimilation of the child, the level of education, quality of education, literacy, yes, yes, nutrition. I want to know because the nutrition history has to do with brain development, okay? Immigration history, trauma, right? Uh, what, what happened in their country, country of origin, instruction in their country of origin. Uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar, write down the Program for International Student Assessment. Program for International Student Assessment. And it, it's, I don't know, 70 some countries. A lot of countries are tested in upper grades and we can get a measure of reading, math, and a special area across the different countries. And we can see where that country um, uh, is placed compared to their other countries. And you can get an idea of their level of education. Not every country is, is there, but it gives you, if, if, if it's one of the countries, like say Mexico or whatnot, they, it's there. I'm from Peru, Peru is there. So it gives you an idea what the quality of education is in that country. If they're in the lower, like Peru is at the very, not the, quite the last, but they, we just improved from the second to the last to maybe the fourth to the last. So, um, so it gives you an idea. If they went to public school in that country, it gives you idea, an idea of their level of education, okay? So country of origin, it's important to know what the quality of education was in their native language. Housing issues, hey, are they living in a car and they're, they're on survival more mode and that's why they're not learning? Stress, racism, social support, healthcare, you know, do they have quality access? And all of that is very important, okay? Remember those exclusionary factors that we talked about, okay? Those are the exclusionary factors. I, I assess language, uh, academic language, look at pragmatics, language functions, lexicon forming, you know, all of these um, issues about language that we've talked about. Um, I don't know why, but, oh, okay. Assess reading, and uh, we talked about reading. Assess universal concepts and skills that transfer across languages. We talked about the alphabetic and orthographic awareness. Uh, habits about reading, content knowledge, assess concepts and skills that do not develop automatically. Is, is print directionality? Are they from a different orthography? The grammar and orthographic features are too different. Cultural schemas, you know, there are a lot of things. Assess knowledge of cognates. We talked about cognates. And then we go into our standardized tests, right? So say we're ready to, and we must give our standardized tests as part of the uh, requirement, or we think that it's needed. So the things that we have to know about uh, this issue says, you know, I, I'm not gonna go over all of the IQ tests or all of the academic tests because there are so many that we couldn't possibly cover all of them, but you have to know the validity and reliability issues. It's so important that we, use valid measures. However, okay, uh, constability, of course, we know an assessment ability to measure what is designed to measure, right? And that reliability is the consistency or degree of accuracy of our evaluation results. But that reliability, uh, the overall reliability of any instrument that we use is only, is the multiplicative product of the reliability of each of its components. What does it mean? For instance, if I'm gonna give a whisk to a child who we think, no, you know, they're English proficient or English dominant because dominance doesn't mean proficiency. They're English dominant, so maybe I'm gonna give a whisk, but vocabulary and comprehension are super low. So if we look at each of its components, each variable of that IQ, and we have vocabulary comprehension are not reliable because they are a second language learner. And maybe even the other ones that are not verbally mediated because of instru instructions given in another language or whatever. But then we can't really rely on that IQ score um, as you know, being reliable. So we have to be very careful because studies have shown that with ELLs, the norms matter so much. Was it norm for the population that we use this instrument for? Having said that, I uh, know of a study, a, a colleague of mine, a neuropsychologist, did a study of an instrument that we don't use in, in uh, the schools, but it's, um, 
it's kind of like a letter number sequence type of type of instrument. So he used it and he gave it to a population in Honduras, and a, and then he used the norms Honduras, Spain, and U.S. So he tested them. The U.S. norms they tested below 50. So the the uh, the uh, percentage uh, was or their percentile ranks were mostly below 50. Then using the uh, Spanish norms, so the U.S. norms and English, the English norms, super low. So they, their scores were super low. When using the Spanish norms from Spain, their scores were mostly above 50, maybe 60, a little bit better compared to the English norms. But then when they used a group from Honduras, it went up to 85. So the variation was humongous, okay? So that tells us that norms matter. It really matters what we use and how, what population we apply. However, unfortunately, in the bilingual assessment world, we do not have norms for every population, every language, every group, everything. We don't, and we have to make do. And that's why sometimes we have to use, and I, I have networks of bilingual school psychologists and neuropsychologists for the last over a decade that I consult with all over the world. And we basically, sometimes we have to use norms of populations that are similar or use norms of what we have, but what matters is the interpretation. Then we interpret basing on our norms. Okay, so we can talk a little bit about that, but. Uh, basically, we can apply the same issue of reliability to curriculum because sometimes we um, we kind of like put down standardized assessment, don't test anybody or whatever. But it's funny because, I, again, I was an RTI trainer, so we let's do everything curriculum only and let's do RTI and that's how we determine eligibility. But I see so much that we are using uh, instructional practice and we're using curriculum that has not, doesn't have the research backing for ELLs. Uh, they are not using background knowledge. They're not taking into account the language of ins instruction, the adequate assessments for formative assessment classroom level. They're not using culturally meaningful reading materials. So it's not reliable either. So we, unfortunately with, e with ELLs, we have to take into account that no, there's no perfect world, okay? so. We really have to um, take that into account. And just to give you an example, um, I'm not gonna talk about like a lot of the, you know, standardized assessment, but something as simple as digit span. Digit span, of course, you think, okay, how, how hurtful can it be if pretty much everybody and their mother knows what to count from one to 10 in English and Spanish. So let's, let's compare English and Spanish, digit span. So English and, and Spanish, uh, if you ask somebody, they can probably, if they're monolingual in English, chances are they're easily going to learn that, okay? But the difference is, and this is a big difference, that um, the differential impact on memorization and later recall, again, we're looking at the brain now, because 5814, if we think about the differences among, among ethnic groups, they're different in cognitive abilities because the syllables for five are different than in Spanish. Five is one syllable, cinco has two. And the memorization, the brain learns through chunking, okay? So each syllable is gonna be one chunk, cinco. So when you're doing a span of like say, maybe three, four, maybe doesn't matter. But then when you get up to six, seven, and you're trying to memorize, you're not really memorizing necessarily the, the numbers, but you're memorizing the chunks. So you're memorizing the syllables. So therefore, the cognitive um, demand of one versus the other is different because of the syllables in each number. So if you look at side by side, you look at the norms of the digit span in English and Spanish, you will see that for the same um, number, you have different norms for the same number of sequence in English and Spanish. And it is because of the cognitive demand due to memorization, due to how the brain processes information. I hope this makes sense. So no, we can't just use norms 
that are for other populations like that. Does that mean we never give big digits span? No. It means that if this is all we have, and say I don't have the with Spanish, and I'm going to give this. Okay, so it depends on what I'm going to use it for. So when I worked in a hospital uh, uh, in the neuropsychology department, we had, whenever we had a patient that was hospitalized due to a stroke or whatever, okay, so we gave a, an intake when they first came, we gave a digit span. And then when, no matter where they were from in English or with the English norms, and then when they were di dismissed from the hospital, we gave it again to see if they had gained it, English norms. So in reality, we were only using to see whether they gain, you know, anything during the stay at the hospital, if we're doing cognitive rehabilitation or whatever. So we can use that test and it's super valid for what we're using it for. But again, interpretation matters. So we have to be very cognizant of that and, and be very careful. Okay. So then we have different um, evaluators. So who takes care of what, and I put it here, kind of like what I said, English dominant doesn't mean English proficiency. So if you have an English dominant bilingual, you can have a monolingual English speaker. But if you have non-English dominant bilingual, ideally a bilingual school psychologist, but again, they don't exist for every language, but I have it there for your um, perusal later on. And then a, a balanced bilingual, meaning that they know both and who would test. Um, you know, I, for me, you know, I'm a violence bilingual, but you know, it depends on who you have. Okay, so what do I use? Um, I always, for every assessment, I try to give a oral language proficiency measure. And I use, personally use the Wilco Johnson for oral language battery. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it and some may not. Um, again, it's a matter of preference, but I'm telling you what I use, but I like this measure because it gives me the cognitive academic language proficiency, remember CAL, um, and, it, and I have relative proficiency indexes, and it can be used to assess English proficiency of all ELLs. So it has comparable uh, between English and Spanish. It has three subtests that I can compare in English and Spanish, and um, I'll show you, and then you can get CALP level. And what I'm looking at is I want CALP level four fluent because instructional implication for CALP four means manageable. So this is an example of a printout. So he, see here I have oral language and here I have lenguaje oral, broad oral language, okay? So broad oral language, these are the three subtests, you know, vocabulary, comprehension, understanding directions. So what I do with this, if, if I'm testing English and Spanish because I'm Spanish bilingual, great. I can use both, but say I'm testing somebody that uh, speaks Portuguese because I don't have, like we may not have anybody in our district that speaks Portuguese and we may have to be the ones testing them. Well, if we give a measure of oral language, at least we can get where they are in English. If they're level four or, you know, if they are um, level three, you know, limited to fluent, we may be able to give some English tests. So I usually give, if they're limited to fluent, I, you know, uh, but then this helps with interpretation. So I use an oral language proficiency test, which are available in the market. So if you don't have one in your district, you may want to talk to, uh, you know, your supervisor to see if you can get one to uh, use for assessment of uh, ELLs. And this is uh, more information I can get comparative language English uh, or um, index between Spanish and English, and you can see the proficiency level. Okay, so this is what I wanted to also talk about because look at this, the proficiency level is 18% proficiency in uh, lenguaje oral or oral language in Spanish versus 14% proficiency in English. And then, um, broad oral 26 versus 23 and then uh listening comprehension spanish versus english 48 versus 29 so compare compared to 90 which is proficient i can tell that in both languages this child is really low you know so for me in spanish if i'm doing a spanish case just with this test, I would definitely consult with a speech and language pathologist because I can see that they have not even developed 
proficiency in their native language. Also, of course, I would have to know how much instruction they were given and so forth. But proficiency, remember we talked about how a language acquisition versus language learning. So the acquisition, you should be able to get it unless you're in a room, not exposed to anything. You should get some level of proficiency that is higher than this 18% or 26% proficiency, right? So I would consult at this point with a speech and language pathologist. If I only have access to the English and I don't have the comparison, you know, again, doing the background, um, the, uh, your homework, doing, getting the background information and so forth would be helpful. But if they're that low, you may want to, especially if they have been here for a long time and they still are this low, you may want to, you know, consult with a speech and language pathologist as well. There's also the Wukum and Jones language survey that gets information and these are the, you know, the scores and then you can get the proficiency level. Um, so you can use this as well. This is another measure. I, I don't use it. I don't have this one. I have the other one, the oral language, um, but this is also really uh, good. These are the scores. And this is the test that is fairly new on the market. And I get a lot of questions about this. And this is one of my, my new favorite tests, your TEAS PVAT. Um, I think uh, we have Jane Wong, uh, who is one of the developers of the TEAS PVAT. She used to work with MHS. And she is probably attending the webinar. So hello, Jane, if you're listening. So I hope that um, you're listening because I can tell you that I have been using ever since this came out is such an ally to my assessments these days because what it is is a, is a test that measures um, uh, vocabulary acquisition. Okay, and I'm going to give you a, a demonstration in a second here. So it gives you, um, it's a measure of vocabulary ac acquisition, but it has dual standardization. So it has norms with English speakers, age two, six to 22, 11. So it's a very broad range and English learners. And if we look here, you know, like um, with English speakers, we have the, the equal split of gender and then the stratification, this matters. So when we look at norms, uh, we have to understand, you know, what, how tests are normed, okay? So the geographic region is the same, parental education level is the same, but look at this, race ethnicity, which is used in English speakers has been removed in um, English learners because what we want is to compare our child, how they are doing on this test, which takes you five minutes to give, it's very short, very fast. And we wanna compare your child as to how they have been learning according to how many years they have been exposed to the English language. And you want to compare them not by race or, or ethnicity, you want to compare them to all English learners. So that's why the norms have been um, uh, changed accordingly. And uh, so it, they we have 53 different languages in this uh, norm sample. So it's really, really broad. And um, I'm going to show you this, how it's given. This is, this is going to take one minute, OK? So hopefully you can hear. It says Apple, in case you didn't hear it, because I have headphones. So the, the computer said Apple, tree. The computer just said tree. I don't think you can hear it because I have the headphones on. Play, the computer said play, and it's a female voice. Hot, the computer said hot. Okay, so this is, oh, this is the practice, this is the other practice, ball, it said ball. Shoes. Okay, so that's basically the Ortiz PVAD and it takes, you know, it's very fast, it doesn't take long. And then you get a printout and, you know, you can see where your child is this particular child I tested, he scored uh, 91 and it was right there on the average range. So you know that they're average, but they're kind of like borderline between low and average. But it gives you information as to whether this child 
compared to the peers exposed to English the same amount of time. So this particular child, say, you know, two or three years exposed to English, if they are learning and they're acquiring vocabulary at a rate that is average, then I think they're in a good trajectory. So that is really good data to have because if, if I know that they're getting good instruction, if I know that they, the, the teacher is doing a good job with all those strategies that I talked about, and they're still here, they're not learning, then there's a problem. But if they're getting good instruction, they're getting average results, then they're on good trajectory. They may not be there yet. And maybe some teachers are a little bit more sensitive and they want them to be a little bit you know, further ahead, but it gives you really good data. Also, it gives you the breakdown of how many nouns they got correct, the percentage of nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions. So uh, this was a young child, so probably not a lot of prepositions. So, and then it'll tell you, are they emergent bits, intermediate bits? You know, so this, this child in particular, he was a young child, so, so you can get a lot of information. So this is a really good measure. Again, it's done by computer. It's very easy. I give it, I use the iPad, I give it, um, and very fast and gives me a lot of additional data. So I give my oral language, again, that I told you about, and I give this Ortiz PVAT to, to help me in um, determining that. Uh, some of you may also, uh, also ask me about the uh, cultural language uh, interpretive matrix. It's also, again, this, some people are saying this is not to be used because it doesn't give you a learning disability. It's not to be helping you determine if they have a learning disability at all. This is basically the degree of linguistic demand. So if you have different tests that you give, you know if they, it has a low language demand, a moderate language demand, or a high language demand, and that really matters when you're uh, giving um, tests. Remember we talked about the, um, uh, digit span, you know, how, uh, how it changes. So the language demand on test matters. So again, if you gave, you can see where they are low, moderate and high, and there's a way to interpret this, but, um, then the other thing is, uh, okay. So, so I, I, based on that, I select my test. So if, uh, I'm going to go back to this, oops, I'm going to go back to here. So I, Depending on whether the child is fluent, if they're fluent or better, then I can give everything in English and it's great, you know. When they're limited to fluent, I use English. If, I, if I'm testing as somebody from Port Portugal or what other language, I may test uh, if they're limited to fluent. If they're limited, I may even, but interpretation is going to matter, right? You don't want to just assume that because they are ELLs, a nonverbal is a must. Nonverbals are also biased. Nonverbal non -verbal tests were also known for different populations. So nonverbal doesn't mean that it's not culturally biased. Um, some nonverbal tests have a level of instruction that you have to give. So you have to be very careful. Sometimes I give the full test to see how they're functioning in considering English, for instance. Say they're limited to fluent, okay? And I want to know, like, they're having lip reading comprehension, and that's one of the areas. Well, I may give a memory test that it gives you a story, and then they have to repeat the story just to see how they function compared to when they're given instructions in English. The result, the standard score I get, or the scale score I get from that story is not going to be valid, reliable, but it is going to give me information as, as far as is that score um, going to reflect how they function in an English classroom? Of course it will. So that is going to help me determine whether the child is having trouble or not. So I do my test selection based on my oral language proficiency. That way, with confidence, I can select my battery of assessments that I'm going to give. You know, in IQ, you may give the KBC, which is really good for cultural diverse. You may give so many um, academics. It really depends on what you like to give. I don't like to endorse one versus the other. I use several ones, you know, the 
KTM, I use uh, uh, Wolf of Johnson, I use several ones. Uh, I use the West sometimes to, it also depend on who's referring, whether it's a hospital referring, because a hospital sometimes, you know, they like certain tests versus other tests. It depends on your school availability, what you have available. So it depends on so many um, aspects. So um, it's important. So then once I finish doing my evaluation, I do my interpretation. Um, I do my interpretation, then I usually try to find, for instance, the difference between English and Portuguese handout given to the teacher. So this, I, I Googled it. I literally Googled it and I found it. So it's just additional information that you can help to develop interventions, but what do you give the teacher? You know, how do you solve the problem? How do you uh, help the teacher or the parent, you know, help the child? So you want to do a little bit of homework and find information. This, I literally Googled it and I found it. So you want to do that, okay? So, um, so the next steps, hopefully you agree that English language learners should be assessed using a modified protocol that we can't just test them like monolingual speakers. You have to know what you need to learn and refine your assessment and treatment practices for ELLs. So a lot of self-awareness and, and see what is it that you need to learn. You need to study more, you need to Google more, you need to take more classes about ELLs or webinars, or I don't mean go to, back to school, but webinars or whatever. And are you really truly committed to using non-discriminatory practice to assess and develop academic and behavioral intervention resources specific for ELLs? It's a commitment. It's more work, as you can see. Hey, you have to go do research. You have to do a lot more. What I can tell you is that if you spend a lot of upfront doing this and developing a protocol of doing classroom level consultation, a lot of classroom level consultation, and a lot of formative assessment, curriculum-based assessment, and do all of that first, your referrals are going to um, be less because you're going to target you know, more people, more kids, and it's going to be better for, for more children. So you definitely want to use that multi-level you know, um, level of support, you know, MTSS or RTI, definitely use that. And when you must test, of course, I, you, know, you have to test using standardized assessment, take into account reliability, validity, you know, and interpretation. Because sometimes, I mean, you, you don't have any other way but to test with what you have. It may mean that you are not ready to place somebody in special education because they just, you just don't have enough data to, with those exclusionary factors that we talked about that it must be that it's not due to language proficiency or cultural factors. It may be that all you can do now is do a baseline. And I know it's frustrating because you think, okay, if they don't go into special ed, they're not gonna get any help. But we are supposed to be providing this scaffolding and this level of help at the classroom level. That way more kids get help. So hopefully we can get into that, that um, you know, practice or we can change that for our schools. Um, you know, you can definitely present this to your um, school and uh, you can um, uh, try to maybe present this to teachers. Again, you're gonna get this. So you can talk to teachers about it and, and you know, try to talk to a principal or whatever because you really want to impact more kids. And, and I believe that a bilingual assessment you have to do classroom level work. So especially, you know, the way we, we talked about it today. Um, we're gonna open in a second to questions, but you know, I'm in all the social media. If you are, um, I noticed by the way, a lot of uh, people ask me, if I don't know you, I'm not gonna be friends on Facebook, but I do have a professional fa uh, Facebook page. So please follow me. And if you like this presentation, write a review on the private practice or reviews are great for me. Um, and follow me in any of the media and I'll happy, happily uh, follow you back as well on the social media, Instagram or whatever. And uh, we can probably open it up to some questions, um, Antonio. Let me see if I can see how. Um, yeah. As a matter of fact, I was able to 
take note of the questions that have been placed over the chat. And okay. the first one reads that if there is an alignment between the Minnesota English Learner Assessments with some with the CELDT and the ELPAC, but unfortunately, I'm not familiar with those acronyms. So if the person can actually um, indicate who is it, and then I can unmute it. Yeah, I don't. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not familiar either with the Minnesota. I just had it up there so to tell them, but I'm not familiar with the different districts measures because those are there's so many that I'm not familiar with that. So, bottom line is, you know, get familiar with your district. They usually every district has a page with all of the ELL data, so you want to get familiar with that. You know. Okay. Uh, but there no, is no one who's okay. There is a gentleman who is indicating that those are actually are from California. But since I am not familiar with the acronyms, if Ivan, if you can actually let me unmute you. Hold on. A second here. Yes, hello? Okay. Yes. Okay. So this was not my question, but the CELT is the old California assessment for English learners. It looks like reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And then the LPAC is the current version. It's a new device test and it's all connected to curriculum. Yeah. So and it measures I'm not, again, from beginner. I'm not, yes. yeah, I'm not familiar with the different tests or the new one and all of that. I've, I've heard of the self and now, um, but I would suggest again for everybody that you go to mm -hmm. it and then do a lot of research and learning, you know, because that's going to give you a lot of preliminary data and if especially if you don't have any way to test the oral language proficiency you don't have any standardized instrument to do that you have a lot of rich information with the ell measures that the district uses so get very familiar with that because that's going to give you information that you can use in order to interpret and help the, the teacher okay the second the second question that i was able to grab reads do the Spanish errors in reading still apply if the child has not learned to read in Spanish? Again, repeat that. Is this yes. Do the Spanish errors in reading still apply if the child has not learned to read in Spanish? Yeah, if they haven't read, learned to read in Spanish, I mean, you all of these, maybe you don't have to worry about transfer and all of that, but the orthography when they're looking at it it doesn't matter but they have learned so orally they still have their native language so even if they have not learned to read they orally have their native language so they may have the sounds in their native language orally so you have to keep that in mind so it will depend on the level and what you know how much exposure the age of the child and it varies so much but keep in mind that you know, language acquisition versus language learner, that language acquisition is just, you know, implicit and it, it's just, you just kind of feel it and learn it. So you still have to inhibit that native language, especially orally when you, when you listen, you know? The third question that I was able to ask over here, it reads that it's based, well, basically, they were, basically what some of the members were indicating is that when we conduct or administer the Woodcock Johnson oral language, our findings do not necessarily align to those of the speech and language pathologists because they will, pro they will no longer provide services to the children if they notice that their functional language seems that they, so they or suggest that they can express their wants and needs whereas our tests are seem to be more inclined to just look at the calc and um, that's actually tends to ignite like some debates between the speech and language yeah. pathologies and the school site so the, yeah. they want to know what so, are your thoughts on that right so there's a difference between oral language proficiency second like for second language and oral language development so if you think about oral language development in general like the development of language which is what your speech and language pathologist would be looking at are they able to learn language any language you know english spanish or any language 
versus oral language proficiency in the second language. So our tests, although are similar or they, they share a lot, when it comes to the eligibility or that level of, of, um, of um, you know, level of complexity, then it may vary. So it may be that they have not developed a second language, but the speech and language pathologist may determine that they are able to acquire language. So it's not a language delay in the sense of, say they were monolingual and they have a language delay. Uh, and also it has to do with districts have a very, um, I mean, they have to be very delayed in order to provide services because I find that I'm in private practice. A lot of parents, if they go to a, a, a private speech and language pathologist, they will get services and they find, you know, language deficits and they provide a service, but in the district they don't because the gap I know in one district, they have to be 70 or below in order to get services, you know, a standard score of 70 or below. So it really varies, but just remember that there's a difference between the language development, normal language development, and second language acquisition. And that's what the oral language, the Wilfred Johnson oral language battery would measure that how level. The other, the other question that was actually brought up to me, it reads that for ELLs, the standardized scores in any language, they offer like a frozen snapshot of a student's skills I'm sorry, oh, yeah. you, you cut off. Um, can you repeat again? For some reason, yeah. it went blank. I'm yeah. sorry. Like for ELLs, the standardized scores in any language offer a frozen snapshot of a student's skills on measures not necessarily norm on ELL, considering the unique language acquisition history, the cultural background, and other factors. And the question is, are standardized scores always necessary to determine eligibility? For so, I would refer to your this well to your state. Okay, it it will vary according to uh, state. So I'm in Florida. In Florida, you uh, you know the according to the Florida statute, you can do eligibility without having standardized testing. Uh, but some states you must do uh, standard standardized testing. I believe like if we're going to measure if we're if we want to recognize dyslexia. I have to do testing, so, you know, standardized testing, but I can't just do standardized testing without looking at all of this because my test will give me scores, but I will not know how to interpret those scores if I don't know everything else about the child. Does that make sense? So um, I believe, you know, and again, I'm a neuropsychology, but I believe that, you know, the brain is very complex and that dyslexia or some reading deficits that are at the brain level that our curriculum-based assessment is not uh, keen enough to identify. So I do testing, but refer to your um, district and your state and what your eligibility criteria is. Okay. There are actually other questions that I mean that I mean brought up right now. One of them reads, do you recommend the usage of the cross-battery assessment in addition to the Woodcock Johnson for oral language? So the Wooper Johnson 4 is only to determine oral language proficiency. So I use that. Well, it has other subtests that I use that are really good actually for, you know, from phonological processing and, and so forth. So it, it gives me a lot of information, but um, the, um, I use a cross battery approach and cross battery means that you select what is needed in order mm -hmm. to answer the referral question, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, I use a cross battery ap approach as a neuropsychologist. I'm gonna be looking at, you know, language, memory, spatial abilities, uh, executive functions, and I'm not gonna give full batteries out of, you know, I'm not gonna give a full Wilco Johnson cognitive. I'm gonna select the specific subtests that I need in order to measure under each area that I need to measure. So it will depend, depend on the referral question. So yes, I use a cross battery approach, but okay. so in addition to, it doesn't mean that one or the other. So one has a purpose, which is to determine oral language proficiency and a cross battery approach measures so many other things yes. and also language. Okay. Here is another, there, is, there are another couple of questions. You will let me know like how many you can take because it seems to me that we are actually that we are on a roll right now. 
It says, I like the fact that the PVAT takes the number of years exposed to language into account. However, what about the variation in opportunity to learn and respond in these years exposed to the second language? Are we only taking into account instruction? How would this affect the validity of the norm? So it's important, like I said, to know, to see what the, um, you know, what the quality of instruction is, right? Mm -hmm. So I never use one single measure. So the PVAT is not to be used alone in order to determine and solidly say, okay, this is it. So if the PVAT tells me that they are, you know, below average at this, uh, at, at this uh, second or third year of instruction, then they must be learning disabled. No, because we just talked about all of the components mm -hmm. of adequate instruction, right? Mm -hmm. If I know that the child was given, you know, targeted research-based instruction for ELLs, accommodations for ELLs in the last two, three years, and the PVAT is giving me information that says they are continuing to be below and the teacher saying, you know what, no matter what I do, they're having trouble. Then the PBAT is just another piece that is giving me valid information for me to make the determination of a learning disability versus language acquisition, right? But if instruction is very poor and the, the PBAT is telling me that, you know, they're below, then I can determine with the PBAT. And I, again, Let's not use one instrument, be the PVAT, the uh, matrix, you know, the, any test that we call Johnson oral language to be the one instrument that gives us the overall saying, okay, based on this score, they must be below or they must be a, learn, a learning disabled. The other question is like, what Spanish assessments do you recommend to assess? orthographic processing in bilingual students? Uh, so what Spanish assessment? So you mm -hmm. basically, it, it's very hard to have a Spanish assessment. So I would resort to curriculum based assessment. So there's like, you know, uh, there's devils in Spanish, you know, so look, look for any of the ones that are mostly for progress monitoring and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, because there is not a lot out there on the market, you know, but mm -hmm. I would use, uh, you know, I used to use devils a lot. I don't, I don't really use because I'm not in the classroom. I'm mm -hmm. not in a bilingual classroom. So mm -hmm. I don't um, really use that anymore, but I used to use instruments like devils to, mm -hmm. to, to, to assess that, yeah. I have to agree on that because as I am a practitioner, my biggest issue is that when I'm looking at orthographic processing, I don't really have like a standardized measure. So I actually have to look at the Devils and Edel and then make try to make mm -hmm. a comparison and try to write about yeah, that. Yeah, the Edel mm -hmm. is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is another question regarding language dominance and it reads, is the Woodcock Johnson other language adequate for determining the language dominance? And if you administer the Woodcock Johnson oral language and both English and Spanish are limited, do you then administer the full battery in English, Spanish, or both? Okay, so the, the oral language, the Woodcock Johnson oral language only has three tests that I use to determine oral language proficiency and in English and Spanish. And yes, you can get dominance because even though, like say, they're higher in English, they may not be proficient, so they may be higher with a CAD level three, meaning that they're not proficient, but their CAD level in Spanish is two or one, so they are dominant in English. So there's a difference between dominant and proficient. Dominant, you can determine between only English and Spanish with the Wuka Johnson oral language, uh, you know, um, one versus the other. So, so then you determine that they are dominant in English if they're higher in English, or you can determine that they're dominant in Spanish is they're higher in Spanish, right? Um, but then you, depending on the level, the, the RPI or CAP level, you can determine whether they're proficient in English. If you're testing a non-Spanish speaker, you're testing a Portuguese speaker or Hmong or whatever, you can determine dominance because you don't have the comparable language in the other language. 
So you can only determine proficiency, not dominance. Now, this is not a test that then, once you have that, you must give the rest of the battery. No, the rest of the battery has other tests that you can use and you can, you know, we're not gonna go over it right now, but you can uh, go Google the information and it tells you if your referral question meets those other subtests, then you administer them. And it has a lot in the, you know, oral language proficiency, but it has phonological processing and so forth. So you may have to give those, but you may not. Maybe you have enough data with your curriculum-based assessment, so you don't have to give the rest. So I'm saying I don't, for any test, I never give the full battery. I only select in a cross-battery model, you select what is needed. You want to select the least amount of subtests from any given battery to answer your referral question. Then the other two questions I was able to gather. One is, if do you recommend like an acculturation measure? Because when it was brought up, I recommended the marine acculturation scale. And I'm not entirely familiar if there have been like some most recent ones because the marine one is already been on the market for quite a while. Okay. Yeah, the, the marine is usually for older kids um, or for older, it's for adults and older you know, adolescents and so forth. But if you look at that and you know, just get an idea, acculturation means how, do they have, how they have become bicultural or not, right? So questions you may ask, look at the marine, but you can do your own uh, scale for that matter because, I mean, I have my, my own that I created. Uh, I don't even have one, but do they watch TV in English or Spanish? Do they listen to music in English or Spanish? You know, uh, who are the friends that they are hanging out with? Um, they, are they, um, you know, like, so, so look at like their world, how are they functioning? Are they still pretty much in their native language or have they transferred? So if kids are listening to English music, they watch TV in English, they play video game in English, you know, so those are acculturation issues. So um, as far as specific skills, I don't have one in particular, but, um, you know, again, you can, you can kind of like create your own if you don't have access to one. Okay. The last two questions are actually also related to assessment practices. One is like if you have any advice regarding adaptive measuring or measures of adaptive functioning in ELL learners. And the last question will be if you know about any current evidence-based assessment practices for children from indigenous backgrounds. Okay, so adaptive, there's nothing that I know that has been normed specifically mm -hmm. for, you know, Spanish or any other populations. Some of the adaptive measures may include them, like they, they will tell you, okay, it matches the U.S. census, which includes Hispanic, but that's really not, you know, again, Hispanic could be English dominant for all we know, you know. So with adaptive, the one thing, we have to use what's on the market, but it may be that you have to do it as an interview rather than letting them fill it out on their own, okay? So that's what I have tried to do. And I kind of go depending on, because sometimes you don't have time, okay? The reality is school psychologists, hey, you're busy, you're in the schools. Who has time to sit with the parent and, you know, or whatever? In some districts they have, I know in my district, they used to have the social worker do the adaptive measure. So it depends on whether somebody can help you interview uh, or the teacher or the parent. But what you want to make sure is that they are understanding the question and so forth, because sometimes they don't. So, and also you can kind of like modify or understand the culture um, and then interpret it differently. Uh, but there's not, with adaptive, we don't have anything known specifically. And also we have so many populations that it's the same problem, you know, with adaptive. And as far as indigenous populations, all I can tell you is that to be careful, because for instance, in Guatemala, even though it's a Spanish speaking country, they have indigenous languages in Mexico and Peru. You know, Peru, we have a second, uh, we have a, an indigenous language as an official language. I, I took it, like I tried to learn it, I don't speak it, but, uh, but we have uh, indigenous languages. So don't assume that if they come from another country, they're going to speak Spanish if they're from South America or from anywhere in the world, ask. Uh, in, in Guatemala, they have 
tons of like dialects, Mayan dialects and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that will change. And maybe you don't find a lot of information online, but do find, do search because chances are you will find it. I have found so much. So be careful with that. But the process will be different, will be the same. Again, is there orthography? Is there like different, um, I, I know I just said, I forget what language when I went to Minnesota or Washington State. I presented in Washington State a couple months ago and there, were, there was a language that had an oral version and a written version. And uh, so there's so much about language. So the process is the same that you have to watch for orthographies. You have to see whether they have the same uh, base, like I said, a romance or if the orthography different. So, so it's basically kind of like the same process but you just have to watch where they come from and, and that don't assume that because they come from South America, it's Spanish automatically, you know? Yeah, well, Dr. Organis, I think that the last remaining thing will be to thank you once again, not only on my name, but on behalf of all of the members of our Facebook group, of your, because of your time and attentiveness, and most of all, because of your willingness in order to help us improve our skills Regard, regarding how we can do better and especially how we can even play justice for our ELO population as diverse as it is. 